Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian, and together with Victor, we are going to present you our five-year journey of how we leverage namespaces in a multi-tenant fashion in order to scale the adoption of Kubernetes at Adobe, and also how we build a foundation for the Adobe's developer platform. Few words about me. I'm currently a lead cloud software engineer at Adobe, and I'm part of the Ethos team, which is the team that powers the Kubernetes platform at Adobe. I'm also a member of the Kubernetes GitHub organization, and currently I'm focusing on contributing as much as I can to the cluster API ecosystem. And when I'm not, not breaking clusters, I like seeking for big bikes, as you can see on the slide. Victor, do you want to in introduce yourself and kick off the presentation? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Varza. I'm technical lead at Adobe. Um, I'm also passionate about open source contributions. I am one of the organizers of Kubernetes Community Days, or KCD, in Romania, which will be the first KCD event in the southeast of Europe. And it will be organized next year in uh, April. Together with Adrian, we are the authors of uh, Adobe's KTE Shredder and Cluster Registry, two open source projects that we successfully integrated to our platform and about which we are going to talk today. In the first part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about Project Ethos, Kubernetes namespaces, and capacity management. And Adrian will continue with uh, governance policies, multi-tenancy at scale, and non-disruptive Kubernetes upgrades, plus a live demo, so stay tuned. Before we dive in, I would like to share with you a nice quote by uh, Martin Kagan, which I found in his recent book titled Inspired. He says, it doesn't matter how good your engineering team is if they are not giving something worthwhile to build. In other words, it is important what your engineering teams are building, but also the target audience. At Adobe, our Kubernetes platform called Ethos, it's used by amazing internal engineering teams, which are working at Adobe products, such as Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Analytics, Adobe Firefly, Adobe Experience Manager, Adobe Sign, and so on. Project Ethos, it's a cross-cloud, multi-tenant, Kubernetes-based platform built through the collaboration between the Adobe's infrastructure teams and product development teams. The initial version of Ethos has its roots in 2015, and it was built with Docker and DCOS, and it was first in production in 2016. It was a good decision at that moment to start with DCOS because we gain experience with containers, microservice architectures, multi-tenancy before Kubernetes became matured. We also build necessary abstractions so a developer can seamlessly deploy his application in production. This abstraction is called Ethos CAS or Containers as a Service. In 2018, we started the development of the, of the next generation runtime platform based on Kubernetes. We identify an opportunity within Kubernetes namespaces and add them as a new option for our developers. This offering is called Ethos Pass, which stands for Platform as a Service. With Ethos Pass, developers take ownership of the Kubernetes namespace and they can deploy their application inside. Of course, we're using their preferred CI CD tool. And uh, this approach gives flexibility to developers, and it is particularly valuable when your application serves as the core CI CD tool and can deploy other applications in Kubernetes. It is also valuable when your company is involved in acquisitions of other companies. So, uh, making my migration of the applications to your company's platform is a straightforward process using Kubernetes namespaces. In 2019, we started the full migration of the legacy uh, CAS users from DCOS to Kubernetes. And in 2022, based on, on the experience that we got with uh, Ethos CAS and Ethos Pass, we introduced a new flavor, which is Ethos Flex. Ethos Flex is running on top of Ethos Pass, and it is based on GitOps and Argo. 
So it provides a pathway to deploy your application in production, but also the flexibility of Kubernetes namespaces. Another big milestone <coughs> was this year when we adopted Cluster API and Argo for the infrastructure side for building and managing Kubernetes clusters. This is uh, ITOS Kubernetes platform from 10,000 feet and how it stands in Adobe. On the top of the slide, we have the three main Adobe Cloud, Creative Cloud, Experience Cloud, and Document Cloud. These clouds are powered by Adobe software products such as Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Firefly, Adobe Analytics, Adobe Experience Manager, Adobe Sign, and so on. And together with the platform that they are using, such as Sensei Machine Learning, Content Platform, Experience Platform, all together are running on top of ETHOS. And ETHOS is basically the Adobe runtime for containerized applications. ETHOS operates on three main cloud providers, Adobe Private Cloud, AWS, and Azure. To better understand the platform scalability, Let's talk about the pretty impressive numbers, which are growing every month. It also hosts more than 2 million containers encapsulated in 1 million pods. And these pods are running in uh, 41,000 tenant namespaces, namespaces which are own, owned by the um, application development teams. We are managing more than 300 clusters deployed on 28 different cloud regions in AWS, Azure, and Adobe Private Cloud. In terms of computing power, these workloads use around 35,000 compute nodes, consuming approximately 2.9 uh, petabytes of RAM memory and, and 800,000 virtual CPUs. The AI applications, which are more and more present to our platform, utilize almost 8,000 GPUs. Let's talk about multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. How many of you heard about multi-tenancy architecture? Okay, whoa. And how many of you are using Kubernetes in a multi-tenant architecture? Okay, we have a pretty good number. I can, I can count them. <laughs> um, there are many definitions for multi-tenancy. At Adobe, we are using multi-tenancy architecture as a way to share multiple physical clusters with multiple teams from different organizations and different projects. And we have two types of clusters, shared clusters and dedicated clusters, also known as multi-tenant clusters and single-tenant clusters. Shared clusters are available for any uh, internal engineering team in Adobe and are highly valuable for optimizing the cost and enhancing the overall platform reliability. Dedicated clusters, on the other hand, are used for two main purposes. Uh, when high security isolation is required, such as for applications that can run untrusted software. For instance, Adobe Experience Manager, which is a content management system solution, can run software written by Adobe customers. Another scenario is uh, when a specific team requires high resource demand for their application which need the entire cluster resources. An example of this is Adobe Firefly, which is a generative AI content creation solution that requires a high resource demand for the available CPU and GPUs inside of a cluster. In order to implement multi-tenancy, we rely on Kubernetes namespaces. And developers love namespaces because they provide flexibility, more control and easy troubleshoot their applications. In ethos, we use a unique namespace name across the entire fleet, and we deploy a namespace profile template on the clusters. A namespace profile template is made by few Kubernetes objects in order to provide a minimum isolation within a cluster. First of all, we need a Kubernetes namespace object to group the objects for a single team within Kubernetes API. To ensure that only a specific team has access to a particular namespace, we are using role bindings that link the default Kubernetes cluster roles, admin, edit, and view. And Kotal limit range play a crucial role in limiting um, 
and controlling resource consumption, ensuring fair resource distribution of the resources inside of a cluster. For network isolation, we are using both Kubernetes native network policies and Cilium network policies. And here, Cilium network policies are useful for implementing DNS-based policies and other Layer 7 policies. After the namespace profile is deployed on a cluster, the tenant can deploy his application inside. And the tenant application objects will be restricted only to a specific team, and the pods will be isolated by the default network policies. In a multi-tenant environment, capacity management is a key consideration because capacity issues may result in higher costs. By the way, who doesn't have cost concerns today when running an application in the cloud? We tend to take actions at three, uh, three levels. At the pod level, so in addition to horizontal pod auto-scaling and vertical pod auto-scaling, we are using a solution named automatic resource configuration. At the namespace level, we simplify quota management using the concept of baseline quota unit. And at the cluster level, we added capacity alerts. Let's go through automatic resource configuration. We know that in Kubernetes, pods are scheduled on the worker nodes based on their container resource requests. And they can burst up to the specified limits. So if the resource requests are lower, then smaller allocations are reserved for that pod. This allows for more pods to be scheduled on the node, which results in cost savings. And to achieve this, we rely on Prometheus metrics to gather uh, historical utilization data for the deployment pods, then an OPA policy is applied to adjust the right size of the CPU and memory request for that specific pods. At the namespace level, in order to simplify quota management operations, we introduce the concept of baseline quota unit, or BQ. A BQ is actually a quota definition and every namespace quota increase, it's achieved by multiplying each of the BQ items. And for example, we have a BQ definition here. And if you want to allocate, let's say, 32 virtual CPUs for our namespace instead of 16 vCPUs as we have right now, we just simply increase the namespace quota from one to two BQs. And the other BQ items will be multiplied as well. So we also have available for our namespace 60 uh, pods to run. And this approach simplifies uh, the operations for both uh, tenant owners of the namespace and uh, cluster administrators. At the cluster level, we measure if a cluster reaches the capacity using Prometheus alerts. And how we are doing this? In ethos, the source of record for cluster information is stored in an application named Cluster Registry, which, by the way, is open source and it is available under Adobe's GitHub organization. And there is a Cluster Registry client that runs in every cluster and accepts signals from other manager. And in Prometheus, we have multiple capacity subalerts that fire based on some specific metric thresholds. And uh, yeah, for example, number of nodes or number of available IPs that can be assigned to a node or number of namespaces and so on. And one of the sub alerts fires, the main capacity alert notifies cluster reg registry client, so cluster uh, information is updated. And for example, namespace onboarding is disabled or even more namespace quota increase is frozen for all of the existing namespaces in the cluster. Uh, now I'm going to pass it to Adrian so we can talk more about uh, governance policies, multi-tenancy at scale, and non-disruptive Kubernetes upgrades. Thank you, Victor. I would like to continue our talk about multi-tenancy, but tackle it from an infrastructure perspective. And I prepared three topics today in order to cover the reliability and efficiency on one hand and scalability and security on the other hand. And I will start with the governance policies. As any company or business is governed by a set of rules, so does a multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster. 
Why are these policies mandatory and what benefits do they bring into the Kubernetes ecosystem? From our perspective, along with the security aspect, there are two main advantages when defining a set of rules inside the Kubernetes clusters. First, it is for safeguarding teams against inter-team collisions, and second, for protecting the cluster stability so that a single development team cannot jeopardize the entire cluster. A few years ago, when we initially started building our platform, we had a pretty interesting outage. One day, two distinct teams created two different ingress objects in two distinct namespaces, but pointing to the same FQDN. And it took us a while until we realized that these two ingress objects were conflicting with each other because there were no validating webhooks implemented by the ingress controller at that time, except the CRD schema. And this was the moment when we decided that a set of governance policies were mandatory. And in order to implement these policies across our cluster fleet, we picked the OPA Gatekeeper framework. For those of you who are not familiar with, OPA Gatekeeper is an extensible admission controller which is already configured with all, the, uh, with all of the necessary Kubernetes API plumbing. And cluster operators can change the business logic of Gatekeeper by simply writing policies, which are rego queries as short as a few lines. And we will see in a bit such an example. But getting back to our outage, after that event, we created the, the validating ingress policy, which denies the creation or update of ingress objects which attempt to use an FQDN, which is already in use by any other existing ingress objects. Some other example policies we are currently deploying across our cluster fleet. If I have to name a few, I will stop to the control plane toleration policy, which is a policy used to restrict the workloads that can run inside the control plane nodes. Cron job history, another policy, which is used to restrict the history of a cron job so that we are not putting unnecessary load on the etcd side. Default ingress class, another interesting policy, which is used to add an ingress class on all ingress objects that are not explicitly specifying the ingress class they want to use. Namespace limit, another policy which is used to limit the total number of namespaces that can be created inside the cluster. And external IP services, another policy which is used to deny the creation of external IP services, and many others. As you can see on the slide, we have a rego snippet that's implementing the external IP services. And as you can notice, with only a few lines of code, we were able to define a pretty powerful policy which is denying the creation of any external IP services. And what is it doing? First, it will check if the object from the request is of type service. Then it will check if the operation is create or update. And in the end, will check if the object spec has any external IPs defined. And if all these three conditions are met, we are rejecting the request and sending back a message to the user stating that external IP services are not permitted because there is a pretty high vulnerability found inside the Kubernetes code base. One thing to keep in mind here is that Gatekeeper, as any other validation or mutation webhook, adds latency to any API request it mutates or validates. Why? Simply because of the extra processing time needed to mutate or validate the request. So the more policies you define, the higher API response latency might be. Another story is about multi-tenancy at scale. As you saw the numbers at the beginning of the presentation, you can imagine we are running at a pretty high scale and challenges for such a big platform are diverse. Recently, we switched from our internally developed CI CD tool to the Argo ecosystem. I guess everyone is already familiar uh, with Argo. We just had a ArgoCon a few days ago. But during our Argo CD evaluation process, one of the first challenges we encountered was the fact that a single Argo CD instance couldn't handle the reconciliation volume needed for our fleet. And to give you an idea, we are deploying between 70 to 90 admin components per Kubernetes cluster. And with a fleet of more than 300 clusters, you can imagine that the total number of applications needed to be synced is over 24,000. 
way higher than a single Argo CD instance can handle. And so, in order to be able to scale the rollout of all the admin components across the fleet, we've come up with a pretty interesting pattern, which we called Argo of Argos. As you can see on the slide, we are running a multi-tier Argo CD setup, where tier zero is used to reconcile the tier one Argo CD instances, and Argo CD instance and tier one Argo CD instances are used to reconcile the, or to sync the cluster admin components fleet-wide. <coughs> Sorry. Moreover, each tier one Argo CD instance is handling only a subset of the Kubernetes clusters that are part of the fleet. Also, all tier one Argo CD instances have the same config and have registered the same set of application sets so that we have consistency across the entire tier one Argo CD instances. And in this way, we accomplished the flexibility when it comes to scalability of the continuous delivery system. We can always add more tier one Argo CD instances or remove them based on our platform needs. And the last story for today is about non-disrupting cluster upgrades. As our platform evolved and started onboarding more and more teams, the diversity of the workloads running on top was also increasing. Some teams started running stateful apps like databases or distributed event streaming apps that, as we know, are pretty sensitive to disruptions. And after we had few outages caused by cluster upgrades, it was clear that we needed to develop a new strategy while doing cluster upgrades because the pod disruption budgets alone were not enough. And we were looking to have a high enough velocity while rotating the worker nodes, but still maintain the client's apps availability and infrastructure costs at some reasonable thresholds. And so we came up with what we call the park nodes upgrade strategy. And this strategy is implemented around K Shredder, which is a Kubernetes controller developed in house at Adobe and then open sourced. It is available under the Adobe GitHub org, and you can scan the QR code from the slide in order to get access to it. How does our non-disruptive cluster upgrade procedure work from a high-level perspective? During a full cluster upgrade, we are draining in batches a percentage of the total worker node at a time while adding new worker nodes. Also, we are cordoning all the existing worker nodes so that no new pods can be scheduled on them. And for the sake of the example, let's assume we have a cluster with two worker nodes, which we are going to upgrade to a newer uh, Kubernetes version. Once the upgrade process begins, as I mentioned earlier, we add a new worker node running a newer version of Kubernetes and then start draining the old nodes. Evicted pods will be moved to the new worker uh, node since the old ones were already cordoned at the beginning of the upgrade process. As the upgrade is progressing, more pods are moved to the new node until there is no capacity on it. And if you are running out of resources, we are simply just spinning up new worker nodes to accommodate all the pods that are evicted by the draining process. Okay. <coughs> if during the configured drain timeout, not all the pods are evicted, the upgrade process will label the worker as parked and add a TTL or a time to leave for it. Also, all the old ones that were successfully drained and which don't have any running pods on them will be recycled by the cluster autoscaler or by the upgrade process eventually. And with that, this is the moment we consider the cluster upgrade as finished. And once the upgrade is finished, development teams that are still running pods on park nodes are getting notified so that they can take all the necessary measures to move their pods out of these park nodes before the TTL expires. And once the training process is finished on all worker nodes, then K Shredder is taking over the process. What is it doing behind the scene? First, it will identify all the park nodes, and then for each of them, we'll grab all the running pods and for each of these pods, we'll run a set of eviction loops. Initially, it will periodically try to soft evict 
all the running pods on the park nodes while respecting the PDBs. And most of the pods will be successfully soft evicted by K Shredder after the uh, after few eviction loops. But some of them won't be able to, but still K Shredder will periodically monitor the TTL of the park node. And if after the configured park node TTL, there are still running pods that couldn't be soft evicted, then K Shredder is taking a pretty aggressive measure and will just force evict all those running pods. And once there are no more pods running on the park node, cluster autoscaler will just uh, recycle this park node. And with that, all worker nodes from the cluster are running the new version of Kubernetes. Putting all these steps together, you can notice that the process is pretty smooth. And eventually, all worker nodes will be running a newer version of Kubernetes. <coughs> OK, let's see it in action. <coughs> we prepared a live demo for today. where we are going to simulate a full cluster upgrade in order to see how Cache Shredder can help us clean up uh, the running pods from a park node. We already have a cluster uh, running with one control plane and two worker nodes, and we are going to park one of these uh, worker nodes. In the upper left uh, terminal, we are going to uh, start labeling and cordoning uh, a worker node. And on the upper right terminal, we are going to watch the pods that are running on the node we are going to park using kubectl get pods and the watch command. And on the bottom terminal, we are going to watch the cache shredder logs so that we can get a feel about what is it doing behind the scene. Let me restart the Key shredder so that we can have some clear logs. Okay, key shredder started. Let's see the running pods. Yeah, so we have a bunch of pods running on the node we are going to park. Pods from different species coming from a stateful set, pods with bad PDBs, pod with allow eviction, that allow eviction, pod that doesn't allow eviction, and so on. Let's park this worker node. We added a TTL for, of just one minute so that we can see a fast iteration of what uh, Shredder is doing behind the scene. As we can see, Shredder already reacted and noticed that there is a park node in the cluster and started the eviction loops for all the running pods. And as you notice, Many pods were uh, successfully soft evicted by the Shredder during the first iterations, but some of them won't be able to. But still, Shredder will periodically try to soft evict them until the TTL of the node will expire. These pods couldn't be soft evicted because they have bad PDBs configured or because the tenant explicitly disallowed eviction. And after one minute, we should see, yeah, uh, Key Shredder is also able to perform rollout restart for a deployment or a stateful set that are, that are behind the running pods. And once the TTL expire on this park node, we will see that Key Shredder is taking that aggressive uh, action and will just force evict all the running pods from the uh, park node. And with that, we can see that we don't have any running pods on the park node, and Cluster Autoscaler can chim in and safely recycle the, the worker node. OK, this was the demo. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Victor for the conclusions. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. Uh, very good demo, and this time didn't fail. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Let's wrap up our um, few takeaways of five years journey of running Kubernetes in a multi-tenant architecture. Uh, there is no silver bullet while building a multi-tenant developer platform. You should always align with your uh, product development teams in this process. 
Every company is different, and it has its own needs and vision regarding to the multi-tenancy architecture. And here, Kubernetes namespaces um, are um, feasible to, to, to build the boundaries. Uh, and the last uh, thing, and also the, not the, uh, yeah, last but not the least, uh, challenges while working at scale are um, different comparing with um, small or medium-sized platform. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I think we have time for questions. Uh, anyway, we will be also available for the next 10 to 15 minutes for offline questions if you have. Also, please scan this uh, QR code so we can provide us some feedback. Uh, thank you, and yeah, if you have any questions, I have one question on the chargeback model. Uh, you have various teams using uh, the shared uh, Kubernetes clusters, right? So how does the chargeback model uh, to these departments work, like the Photoshop team or EM team or various? Yeah. Uh, do you have anything in pro uh, process? Or the second question is, how do you focus on optimization? Some teams just over provision, right? Like mm -hmm. don't set the right, uh, right resource limits. How do you, how do you optimize that? Yeah, so, so for, for the first question, how uh, are you charging back uh, our users, right? Um, we are using a solution called KubeCost for this, and with some algorithms, we provide them uh, what is the actual cost for running uh, their application in our namespace or in our clusters, because we have also uh, users that use dedicated clusters. They, they, they basically use the entire cluster. And also, ah, yeah. please. And also, we are adding labels on the namespaces, like service ID, the team that it's running inside that namespace, and we can easily correlate the pods running in that namespace with a specific team, and so that we can easily charge back them. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we tried that, uh, so more going to... I'll, I'll definitely explore that. Uh, the second uh, question around the optimization, uh, yeah. the resource limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the resource lim limits, as I uh, showed in the presentation, we have um, a project called Automatic Resource Configuration. It, it's an internal one, but we are thinking to, to open source it. So basically, based on the Prometheus metrics, you calculate how, um, what is the right size of the CPU and memory request that the uh, pod should have. Then we label the deployment. Then an OPA policy will hook when the pods are created on the cluster. And just at that moment, we um, uh, optimize the right CPU request and memory request for that pods. Yeah, one yeah. mention to your question is that we are not changing the resource limits, only the resource request, because the scheduling is done based on the resource request, not on the limit. That's why we can overcommit uh, uh, on worker nodes. Hi, um, I had two questions also. Um, one question is you showed the sort of the namespace profile and all the namespace objects that get set to control things like the quota and the limit range yeah. and role bindings. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the developer teams don't set those because they kind of constrain what the team can do. So how do those get there in the first place and how do they get updated when there's like a new standard for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. So actually we have uh, an automation that uh, uh, five years ago it was a script and we provision namespaces using Jira tickets, you know, and then we add it in, into an automation, an API, and uh, those profiles are static, uh, are controlled by us, and they are deployed on the cluster uh, by, the, by the user, so it's a self-service mechanism to deploy the, the namespace profile on the cluster, but they don't control the profile, actually. We, uh, we are controlling the profile, and depending on what we are changing on the profile, even us, update the profile on the cluster, but if it's something that can impact an application like network policies, uh, we delegate to, to the end user to, to do the update. Yeah, and one addition here is that tenants are not directly talking with the API server when they want to create a namespace. They are talking with our uh, ethos Kubernetes on border, it's an, uh, the application, and that application is talking with the API server when creating a new namespace. And that uh, tool is also adding this namespace profile, all the uh, network policies and all those stuff. Yep. Okay, and the other question is, um, you, know, you mentioned cluster API at the beginning, but 
where does cluster API fit into this whole picture? <laughs> uh, it doesn't fit in our presentation, but uh, I just mentioned that it's a milestone that we should mention that we, uh, for the infrastructure, are uh, actually adopted the cluster, cluster API and also Argo to building and managing Kubernetes clusters. Yeah, it's just a mention to is, is one of the Argos in that two-tier picture a part of that yeah. infrastructure piece? Yeah. yeah. OK. Thanks. Uh, yeah. 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 We can take offline the yeah. discussion because we finished the, the time. Thank you very Thank much you. again.